So this lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra, or possibly homological algebra, and will be about the ext groups, um, where A and B are modules over a ring R, and we're going to define um, these groups. So they're sort of analogues of the tense of, of the tall groups. So, so you know, we, we can take a tense of product of two modules over a ring, and from this tense of product, um, we defined um, various tall groups um, of A and B by taking a resolution of B and tensioning with A and then taking homology of it. And instead of looking at the tensor product of A and B, we can also look at the group of homomorphisms from A to B, which will be um, um, an R module if R is commutative. And these will give rise to groups, um, the, the, the X groups in a similar way. So um, um, how do we do this? Well, we're going to be very lazy. I'm just going to set go through how we defined tall groups and then wave my hands and say we do a similar thing to get X groups. So, so let's have a slightly closer look at how we define tall groups. Um, in fact, you notice the definition of tall group works for any right exact functor. So let's take a right exact functor F of A. So what does this mean? Well, it means that if we've got an exact sequence, naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught, then F of A goes to F of B, goes to F of C, goes to naught is exact. Um, however, um, this map here um, need not be onto, so it, it's not left exact. And a typical example of this is F of A, equals m tensor a for some, some fixed module m. So, you know, tensor products are right exact. And um, we can define the so-called derived functors or left derived functors li of f as follows. So these are going to be a generalization of Tor. So um, first of all, we um, let, let, let's take derived functors of a. We take a resolution of A by three modules. So we have A and R to the N naught and R to the N one and so on. And then instead of taking a tensor product with B, which is what we did to define Tor, we just apply the functor F. So we get F R to the N one goes to F R to the N zero goes to zero, so we sort of delete A, F R to the N two, and so on. And we notice that this is not an exact sequence in general. There's no reason why it should be, because F doesn't preserve exactness, it only preserves right exactness. And thirdly, we take homology. And the homology of these will be called the left derived functors of F. So this the, the, the homology of here will be L naught of um, L naught of A and the homology, sorry, L naught F of A, and this will be L1 F of A. I mean the homology of this will be L1 F of A and so on. Um, and you can see in the special case when F is M tensor A, this is just the definition of the tall groups we had. Um, and there are some basic properties of these derived functors. First of all, L naught F is the same as F. That, that, that follows because F is right exact. Secondly, L I is well defined. So for that, we just copy the proof that Tor is well defined. You remember there was something about um, a homotopy between maps of chain complexes and so on, and that all works for any functor. Um, thirdly, it's functorial. Again, this is very easy to check. And fourthly, we get a long exact sequence, essentially by copying the proof of the long exact sequence that we had for Tor. Um, now we notice that for this, we do not need 
three modules r to the n i we can use projective modules in other words we can take a resolution of a by projective modules p0 p1 and p2 and so on and the reason for this is the only property of free modules we ever used was the fact they're projective so we repeatedly used the fact that if we've got a map um, from b to c that's on to and if we've got a free module that maps to c we can lift it to b and that was the only property of free modules we used well that's just the definition of projective modules so we may as well use projective modules well that doesn't really gain us anything because you know we may as well just use free modules what's the point of switching to projectives well there's a dual notion of projective module called injective module which says that if we've got um, um, a submodule C of a module B and we've got a map from C to I, then we can always lift this to a map from B to I. So, so this is the definition of an injective module. And you see an injective module is just like a projective module, except you reverse every single arrow you can think of. So what's this good for? Well, um, Suppose we've got a left exact functor. So, um, so this means that if naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero, is exact, then um, naught goes to F A, goes to F B, goes to F C, is exact. Um, and there's an obvious example of this. Let's fix a module X and let's put F of A to be HOM over R from X to A. Then F is left exact. And you can see this, if naught goes to A goes to B goes to C goes to naught is exact and so is naught goes to HOM X to A, goes to HOM X to B, goes to HOM X to C. And you can ask, is this always on to? Well, not necessarily. For example, we can take our standard counter example, naught goes to z goes to z goes to z over 2z. And um, we take x to be z over 2z. And then if we look at naught goes to hom z over 2z to z, this maps to hom z over 2z to z. And this maps to hom z over 2 to z over 2z. And this group is 0, and this group is 0, and this group is not 0. So this map here is not on 2. So, so hom from x to x to something is left exact, but it's not generally right exact. Um, and now we can define um, derived functors of this. So we're going to define the deri right derived functors of f as follows. So um, if we want to define this on A, we take an injective resolution of A. So we take naught goes to A, goes to I naught, goes to I1, goes to I2, and so on. Then we apply f and forget about a, so we get naught goes to f i zero, goes to f i one. And thirdly, we take the homology of this. And the, the homology groups of this complex are going to be the right derived functors f of a. And um, everything works just like the left derived functors we defined earlier. So you know, in, in, we, we just sort of reverse every single arrow. So instead of looking at right exact functors, we look at left exact functors, which are the same, except you've reversed all the arrows and so on. And this has the usual properties. It's well defined. Um, and R naught F is just the same as F. And it's functorial. And we get a long exact sequence 
which I'll show some examples of in a moment. Um, so we can do this um, for um, if F A is hom um, um, X to A, then these right derived functors are I of F of A. It's just the functor X of I over R of um, X and A by definition. So it should be hom over R. Um, so um, let's work out some examples of this to get familiar with it. So we'll do the simplest example, which is we just take R to be Z. And we need to know what are the injective modules for R? Well, we'll, we'll study injective modules in a little more detail in a, in a later lecture. So let's just comment for the moment that injective modules are the divisible ones. This is true over any principal ideal domain, but not true in general. Um, but it's fine for the integers. So let's calculate x um, of z over nz with um, an and z. So this is going to be x i over the integers. Um, so we need an injective resolution of z. So we need to map z into a divisible group. So we get naught goes to z, goes to, let's do, we can just take the rationals. Rationals are divisible, and so are the rationals modulo z. So we get a very short um, um, resolution. So, so, so these are the injective ones. And now, in order to work out x, we apply hom of z over nz to whatever this is, and, and we, we delete the z, we forget about the z, so we get naught goes to hom z over nz to q, goes to hom z over nz to q over z, goes to zero. And now we need to take the homology or, uh, of, of this sequence, I should call it the cohomology. So there are no homomorphisms from z over nz to q, so we get naught here. And the homomorphism from z over nz to q over z is just isomorphic to z over nz. So the homology of this bit is zero, so this is x naught of z over nz to z, which is the same as hom of z over nz to z. And this is now x1 of z over nz and z. Um, well, we should, um, we should really work out this group for all um, um, and I, I think I should have said here that I'm taking n to be greater than zero because if n is equal to zero, we get something a bit different. Um, um, the, 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 then this isn't right. You see, the, 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 this is only zero if if n is not equal to zero. Um, so um, um, now now let's work out x of z and z. That, so this would be the case when n was equal to zero in the previous one. Well, again, we take um, the resolution naught goes to z goes to q, goes to q over z goes to naught. And this time, if we apply hom z to something, we get um, q goes to q over z goes to naught. And now if we take the homology of this, well, we just take the kernel of q goes to q over z, which is just z, and this map is onto, so the homology is zero. So this is x one of z with z, and this is x zero of z and z. And we should finish off just by calculating x of z over, over nz, z over mz. 
So now we need to take an injective resolution of z over mz, and we can do this by taking naught goes to z over mz, goes to q over z, which is divisible, so injective, goes to q over z, goes to zero, and this is just multiplication by m. So here, here's our, our injective resolution, and now we apply hom z over nz to everything, except for this, which we forget about as usual. So we get naught goes to, well, hom z over nz to q over z is just z over nz. So we get z over nz goes to z over nz, and this is multiplication by m. Now we take the homology of this, and the homology of this is easy to work out. Here we get z over the highest common factor of m and n, and we get the same here. So this is x naught of z over nz, z over mz, and this is x one of z over nz, z over mz. And the x for uh, x two and x three and so on always vanish. In fact, they that they, they do for any modules over the integers, as we will see in a moment. The next question is, why is x called x? Well, this is short for extensions, and the reason is that x one classifies extensions. More precisely, x1 of c and a classifies extensions naught goes to a, goes to b, goes to c, goes to zero. These are extensions of c by a, or possibly extensions of a by c. I can never remember which way around they go. Um, and two extensions are called the uh, uh, you, you, you can divide extensions into equivalence classes. So, um, so two extensions are the set considered to be the same if there's an isomorphism from this B to this B. Um, and turns out that the isomorphism classes of extensions of A and C correspond to this group here. Let's see why this is so. Well, first of all, suppose we've got an extension, naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero. Well, then we can look at the long exact sequence of X groups. So we get naught goes to hom C to A, goes to hom C to B, goes to hom C to C, goes to X one C to A, goes to something. Well, we don't care what happens after that. And now hom C to C has an obvious element. It has the identity map. As, as a sort of canonical element in it. And we can just take the image in here. So we get an element of X1, C and A. Um, so X is just D. Um, uh, I'm not sure we really call this boundary map D. But it's, it's, the, it's the image of the identity map under this map from home C to C to X1, C to A. So that, so that gives us a way to get from extensions to elements of the X group. Conversely, suppose we've got an element X in X1, C, A. Well, we can get an extension out of it as follows. What we do is we take a, a resolution of A by injective modules um, and um, now the X groups are the homology of hom C to I naught goes to hom C to I one goes to hom C to I two. So X is in this group here. That means X um, gives us a map from C to I1, whose image in I2 is zero. Now what we can do is we construct an extension of A by C just by taking the, the um, product of I0 and C over I1. In other words, we take the elements of the product I0 and C with the same image in I0. And now you can check that um, here, 
um, we have an extension of C by A. Um, so this shows how to get from extensions to elements of the X group and how to get from elements of the X group to extensions. And you can check that these two correspondences are, are inverses of each other. So, um, um, so this really does classify extensions. We can just see a very quick example of this. Suppose we take A equals C equals Z over 2Z. Then we calculate an X1 of C and A was isomorphic to Z over 2Z. So it has two elements. It has an element zero and an element one. And these correspond to the following two extensions. We can take naught goes to Z over 2Z, goes to Z over 2Z times Z over 2Z, goes to Z over 2Z, goes to zero. So this is the split extension. It's just a product of these two. And the split extension is the one that corresponds to the zero element. This is easy to check. And there's a second extension. Um, we can take z over 4z. And this is non-split. So non-split extensions correspond to non-zero elements of the x group. Um, well, for Tor, we had this balance property that Tor AB is isomorphic to Tor BA. Um, this obvious analog, and this is certainly not true for X. We can see that X of A, B is not equal to X of B, A in general. Um, that's not even true for X zero. However, there is a sort of analog of the balance property. Um, this corresponds to the fact that we can compute Tor by taking a resolution either of A or of B. And similarly for X, we did it by computing a resolution of, using a resolution of B, but we can also do it by using a resolution of A. However, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, the problem is first of all, that HOM of C to A is contravariant in C. Um, so that means it sort of reverses arrows. So if we've got an exact sequence, naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero, um, then we get a sequence HOM C to M, HOM B to M, HOM A to M, and the arrows go the wrong way. Um, and this map here is not on to. And this gets a bit confusing because does this mean this is this right exact or is it left exact? Because if it was right exact, we should take a projective resolution of C. And if it's left exact, we should take a, an injective resolution. Well, it turns out that um, we, we, we can calculate X of I C to A by using a projective resolution of C. Um, and um, the result is the same as using an injective resolution of A. So this is this is the balance property of X. It means you can either use a resolution of C or a resolution of A. And the proof that it's uh, you get the same both time is sort of vaguely similar to the proof that I gave for Tor. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through it. Um, so um, we should have one example of, of X to the I not equal zero for I greater than one. So over the integers, x of i always vanishes if i is greater than one. And it's not difficult to find examples. We can more or less copy the example we gave for Tor. So we just take um, r is the ring of polynomials in one variable modulo x squared. And we're going to take the modules a and c to be just k, which is r over x. 
and um, we want to calculate x to the i of c and a. So um, let's take a projective resolution of c. Well, we can do this by taking r goes to um, k goes to naught, and then we get a resolution of this as, as we had for Tor. And now we apply um, hom of this to A. Um, and um, the only thing you've got to be careful about is that arrows now go in the opposite direction. So we get um, hom r to C goes to hom r to, sorry, r to K and so on. And um, these are all just k, and the maps between them are all just zero. So if we take the homology of this, we just get the groups k everywhere. So, so we find that x of i of k and k is just isomorphic to k for all i greater than or equal to zero. Um, OK, so that's the end of the summary of X groups. Um, there's one problem with the X groups that we sort of um, didn't go into too much detail. Um, we said we used an injective resolution of a module. Um, the problem is we haven't actually shown that a module has an injective resolution. So the problem is, um, are there enough injective modules over a ring? In other words, for every module, can we find an injective module that it embeds into? And the answer is you can. In fact, um, um, th th there's even an almost canonical injective module it embeds into called an injective envelope. So we will discuss these next lecture. <laughs>